Okay. Um, in this video, I've been wanting to do um, this video for a while. And I'm going to try to give some background and be as accurate as possible. But um, the, the visions are pretty much burned into my mind. And I've thought about them so many times. I've revisited the imagery and the meaning so many times. And as uh, over the past couple of years, they've seemed to gain more meaning and a little more of a mysterious element too. So all that being said, to the best of my memory, this, this was probably around July of 2020. And um, all through that year, I had more visitations and, and visions than the previous seven years combined. It was, it was a year when God really started to tap on my shoulder and um, get, try to do His part to get my attention. And uh, so all that being said, um, there was one morning that I woke up real early. It was probably around five that summer. And I was reading in my Bible the story of Isaac and how Isaac had um, kind of an agenda to reclaim his father's wells. Uh, if I remember the story correctly, Abraham's wells had, had kind of been filled in with dirt and covered to a degree. And uh, Isaac wanted to water his flocks, so he told his servants to, to kind of redig them to get back down to the water. And uh, the first few attempts that his servants uh, re excavated or, you know, reclaimed and dug the wells, some other tribe or group of people came along and contended with them and said, hey, that's, this is our water, this is our well, you know, and technically it was Isaac's father's well, but he didn't really uh, dispute with these people, he just moved on to the next one. And uh, after a series of these attempts on the last in the story, the last attempt, they reclaimed this well that was all to himself. And no one contended with him, and no one could. And he actually named it a special name that signified this is, you know, a well without any strife. Um, and so when I read this account of Isaac reclaiming his father's wells, it made me think about the church and how the Bible is a, is a well of, of information, truth. Um, it, it is infinite in the application in all the different believers' lives. So we have this well, but people contend over it, and they um, argue over it. And so if you have a certain doctrine or a view of what a scripture might mean, or the possibilities of what God can do based on a certain account or scripture, there's always another believer out there that would want to argue with you. Some of them might say, oh, that's not literal, or whatever. Um, or the Holy Spirit doesn't speak anymore, or there's not prophets anymore, or we're all going to be raptured. We don't have to be persecuted. I mean, you can sit there and debate with uh, people, they'll say, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You know, there's all these topics, like the wells, where when you discover it in the Bible, there's people that want to contend and argue about it. But what was particular about my revelation on this morning was, Isaac found a well that was his father's that was all to himself now. And there was nothing anyone could do about it. And nothing anyone was doing about it. And so that made me think about these personal revelations 
or personal things that God does for us as, as individuals. So I may have a testimony, or God may have done a miracle in my life that's for me. And if, if anyone wants to argue about it, I mean, there's, it won't matter because it's, it's in my heart, it's in my mind, it was received by me. And there's other things, I guess, that uh, we receive from God that some people, they don't share, and it's, it's all to themselves. But when you get a, revel a revelation, like a vision, or, or a dream that's only for you, it's unique to you, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking, like, oh, you know, your, your word is a well, your spirit is a well, and we can have it all to ourselves. We, we want to be able to share it and give a testimony about it, but at the end of the day, if you can have your own well and go back to it, you'll always have water. Okay, so this is what I was thinking this morning. Not this morning, but that morning. And uh, so I, lay, I, I knew God wanted to speak to me. So I, I laid down on my couch and just became still. And I said, Lord, um, what, what would you want to show me? And I wasn't there long, and I could sense a, a heavy peace, the kind of peace that just steals your mind. And a lot of times, before the Lord shows me something, I, I just get this peace wash over me, and my heartbeat becomes this steady, pure, I'm self-aware of my heartbeat, and, you know, sometimes he, he'll just give me that peace with no message, and then sometimes that means get ready, you know. So I had my eyes closed, and I had three visions this morning, and they were consecutive, consistent, all within a few minutes, just within a couple of minutes. The first image was of hands rubbing, and, and you, I could see the hands were kind of chubby, and there was a guy, you know, it was like a man's hands with a ring that signified, like, power. And I saw these hands like they were just plotting. So the word that came up in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit was, there's a plot. There's some kind of a wicked plot. You know, a greedy plot. So when I saw these hands, it made me think, greed, plants, you know, some agenda, okay, maybe even what you would call some sort of uh, conspiracy of greed. I said, okay, Lord, I, I saw that. The next thing I saw was like a cup or a bowl. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't big. Well, it, kind of all relative. It, it seemed almost like a cup or a bowl. You couldn't really tell. And it had this, it looked like rotten grape juice or rotten wine, kind of murky. And then these invisible hands, you could see them, but they were still not solid, were stirring this cup of liquid. And what came up into my heart and mind was a cup of wrath is being stirred. That's what my impression was. And in that moment was there's a cup of wrath that's almost full and it's being stirred. So, okay, I saw that, Lord. And the next image was very clear. It was... A vision of the open terrain, just say land as far as you could see, almost like a desert plain, um, very flat, no distinct features, but in the very distance I could see a column of smoke, black smoke, that went up to the top of the stratosphere, atmosphere. It just, 
it was a vertical column of black smoke in the, in the far distance just went up and up and up and up. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, I think when it got destroyed, they depict it as, you know, smoke that went up and up forever. And then in Revelations, uh, Babylon, when it gets destroyed, this smoke is going to be visible for miles and miles and miles. So I saw these three visions, and I had no fear. I had more of a, a calm reception and peace. And I said, okay, I saw this, Lord. And um, they were distinct images. And again, this was probably six months into COVID. And so it made me believe, you know, something was up. Um, something was up behind the scenes, even more than what we, you know, could imagine. There's some wicked, greedy plot that's provoking God's wrath. Okay. That being said, um, I want to say within that same week, I took time in the day to lay down again. I said, okay, Lord, is there anything else you would like to show me? And I could instantly tell, you know, I was going to hear or see something from God. And so, I, you know, I laid there and God gave me three more visions. Okay. Um, these were the opposite. Whereas I would define the first three as judgment or war kind of warning about some things that were dark which would lead to judgment and that God was taking notice um, and not happy. He was not happy with something. Um, these next three were about God's kingdom. So the first image, it was so bright and alive that I could see it was a close-up image of a vine, a very thick healthy vine that went horizontal. So if you garden, it looked a lot like a, a very healthy tomato vine. Okay? And you could tell there were some shoots that were going vertically up, but there were points on this vine that I knew were for grafting. Uh, grafting is a technique where it ha has different applications but in horticulture or raising plants, you can graft a branch onto a rootstock. Or in, in a vineyard, you can take the roots of, of one type of grape and graft another type of vine from a different variety of grape onto that rootstock and end up having you know, a, a grape that will grow. Um, it's not really a hybrid, but it's kind of a two-in-one. They even do it with citrus trees where you take a citrus root stock and, and trunk and you can graft lemons, oranges, and limes all on the same tree. So those are just examples. So in this vision, there were points for grafting. Now I'm a, a beekeeper and the image that God used... Uh, were these cell cups where you make queen bees. So I know how to raise queens. I worked for a commercial beekeeping outfit. And you take certain larvae at a certain stage of development and put them in these cell cups. And the size of that cell will tell the worker bees to fill it up with so much royal jelly and then that larva will eat so much royal jelly, it turns into a queen. The only difference between a worker and a queen is how much royal jelly it gets uh, in that developmental phase of its life. So the way that God used these grafting images on the vine, it, it made me believe this. God wants to graft people into his kingdom. Um, in John 15, I believe it is, the Lord says, I am 
divine, you know, and my Father is divine dresser. He talks about how the Lord can prune you so that you bear more fruit. But in this particular instance, I've seen it, I've seen God do it in my life. He can graft a person into your life like that through, it could be through um, unsuspecting what seems serendipitous. It could be from obedience. It could be from you taking a leap of faith going out of your comfort zone and you meet someone and it changes your life. It, you know, you could meet your spouse that way. You could meet your next employer. Um, all sorts of things. Uh, you could meet someone in a coffee shop who invites you to church and then you go to that church and then you meet your new, you know, group of friends in Bible study or uh, meet... Like I said, when God grafts into your life, He can do it real quick, and then it ends up bearing a lot of fruit. So this image made me conscious that God wants to graft, and that He has spaces reserved to graft. Maybe not only into His, his kingdom for people to come into knowledge of Him, but for people who are already believers to have other believers grafted in so that you can form a community. Um, it, it could have meant, it's pretty deep, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that, but the first image was a, a very healthy vine with places to graft. Okay. The second image that I saw, which just followed this one, was a grid of ants and they were perfectly spaced like dots okay and let's just say there was a five by five grid or it could have been a seven by seven so these ants were all in a perfect grid and overlaid on top of that grid of ants was a large what looked to me like a a crook neck squash or a butternut squash it was a large gourd edible gourd or squash cut in half and so i said okay i see that you know and that made me believe um, a few things or think about a few things one was that god already has a network of ants workers you know that have been preparing for quite some time. So in the scriptures, ants come up twice, and one of them, it says that the ants, they gather in the summer, you know, so that they'll have basically, it's basically saying they gather in the summer while they have uh, the opportunity, you know, so that they'll have enough in the winter. And then another one says, go to the sluggard, I'm going to go to the slugger. Go to the ant, you sluggard, you know, basically saying they're very diligent. And so you think about an ant, it can only carry so much at one time, but it makes many trips, and those trips add up, and then that can yield a large fruit, which in this instance was like a edible gourd. I also, as I thought about this, you know, as a prepper type person who has, there's been seasons in my life where I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. Like it was my responsibility to learn how to grow enough food for my community or uh, my family or store up enough food. Um, and then when COVID hit and the shelves were empty and people were hiding in their houses or whatever, it just made me even more um, aware of how suddenly a crisis can emerge and food shortages, they can emerge and not go away. Um, they could, it could be prolonged depending on the circumstance. So this vision, seeing there was a multitude of ants in a grid, it made me think, God's already got a network. He's already, he knows, you know, and there's people that are being faithful. So I'd get on YouTube 
and Google famine, you know, because God told me there's going to be a famine. He told me that 12 years ago. So I see all these other believers that said God was showing them we're going to have certain food shortages, severe food shortages. And so, you know, they're sharing what they might do. And hearing that, uh, coupled with this vision, it kind of lets you know, okay, it's not all up to me, it's up to God. And God is speaking to a multitude of His people, and so I can kind of, you know, take it down a notch and put more trust in God that He has a strategy. Um, and He has obedient children. So that's kind of my takeaway from, from that vision is, is that God wants to maybe even further build that network so that it's a community and that it can bear a lot of fruit through the production of food. That's uh, There was a, one other revelation that I got because the type of fruit, it was, it was like a butternut squash. Those types of uh, heirloom squash, they call them winter squash, they're not as perishable as other vegetables and they're exceptionally nutritious. So you can pick a butternut squash and put it on your countertop for a month and it'll just stay good. And the old timers and the Native Americans and the settlers that came to North America would breed these different winter squash because they wanted them to keep all winter long. They didn't want a highly perishable um, food source. They wanted it to keep as long as possible. So some of these gourds, you'd say, like pumpkin type uh, vegetables, they, they can keep for three months, six months, some of them up to a year, and they're very again, nutritious compared to something like celery or lettuce. So it made me think, maybe God wants me to specialize in growing highly nutritious vegetables that can keep for a long time without refrigeration, without any additional inputs, you know, no dehydration, etc. So um, it, it, it opened my mind as I used my valve example, it opened up the brain to go, this isn't my favorite food in the world, but God has some wisdom in that, and people 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they had a special place for these seed, these seeds and these crops to get them through hard times and winter months. That's a long explanation for that one. But those are the thoughts when God gave me this vision that over the course of days and weeks, I'm just meditating on it and, 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 and searching out the image and, and praying for wisdom about it, going, Lord, what, what did it mean? Well, the, the third image was to me the most powerful, and it was a hand, open palm, like my own hand, with seeds in it, but these seeds were almost like jewels, and they were all different. They were beautiful. They looked like jewelry, um, transparent, very lucid, luminous, um, almost like glass, crystal, um, but there was something about the seeds. They weren't really biological, that they seemed indestructible. And so, um, after looking at that image and seeing it in my mind, you know, through the vision, I said, these are eternal seeds. And um, that's the word that came to me, eternal seeds. And that was the, re that was the ultimate purpose Revelation, um, I think, the way that, that God ended that series of three images. And so, as I thought about the eternal seeds, it got real deep for me. I said, 
So we can plant something now in, in someone's life. We can sow into someone and there's going to be an eternal growth. You know, I've, I've been gardening for a long time. And sometimes you plant a seed and it never sprouts. Sometimes you plant a seed, it sprouts, and a worm will come and, and just cut the stem and kill the plant. Other times you could uh, plant the seed, it gets off to a good start, and then um, a drought hits or a wind, a, a, a strong uh, wind gust comes and twists the stem and breaks it. There's, there's so many things that can happen to a to a seed and a plant that you that you sow an ant an animal can dig the seed up and just eat it and uh, I, I don't want to go too much into all the things that can go wrong but with these seeds I knew they were in, indestructible they were eternal and they had eternal purposes and it made me think that in my lifetime Lord willing I'll be able to sow seeds into people's lives that's going to be an eternal impact. Um, and so this particular vision helped me get out of the day-to-day -day mindset, the little micro battles of wrestling with my own flaws and the flaws of the you know people around me. And it made me think, okay, there's, there's some things that are not just life-changing, but eternity-changing. And if, if the Word of God is one of those seeds, um, spending time with someone is, is sowing. Um, monetary um, gifts at the right time can really be the biggest help sometimes. You know, it, it, it all depends. You could give someone a car. You know, we had a girl, girl, a young lady. She has a special place in my life, and I knew she was uh, trapped at home and had kids. And um, so I basically communicated this to another person who communicated it to another person. And before you know it, a complete stranger to her gave her a, a car. And it helped her to get to church, and, and she had a, or has a gift of, of singing and, and worshiping and leading worship, and that kind of got her from being trapped at home to using her gift, and it completely changed the trajectory of her life at that time. So I, I see that was like an eternal seed that just completely changes a destiny. So um, you can think about e eternal seeds and, and how complex that concept could be, but even giving a prophetic word could be an eternal seed. Being obedient, you know, someone like Drew Wyatt, who gives these prophetic messages about uh, silver and XRP, that's an eternal seed. He's sowing. He's throwing it out there. Where whatever grows, grows. He doesn't know who's going to watch those videos, who's going to stumble across them and be obedient. You know, one person may listen to it and they have a little bit of faith and, and they buy a little bit of XRP and a little bit of silver. And another person can say, I knew I was, I'm not crazy. God told me the same thing and God told him. So you get this faith building, you know, through the words of someone else's testimony. And so now you're going, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat this with all seriousness and severity. I'm going to go all in. I'm pushing all in because this is what God said. There's no telling what that's going to yield. So all that being said, I said, okay, Lord. And I'm funny like this. I said, three visions and three visions. I said, that's six. You know, and... Nobody <laughs> likes the number six. Uh, Christians don't like the number six. I said, if you could show me one more vision, it'd be seven. 
and it would be perfect and complete. So I'm sitting there going, okay, Lord, if you could just show me one more thing. Well, it didn't take long, and he showed me it was like a, a special delivery, uh, you know, prop. So imagine like a FedEx envelope going whoosh, into view. It just the it just came into view, and it said priority. So priority mail is some category of U.S. Postal Service where it's priority, it ships faster, you know, priority. So I said, okay. So obviously what God just showed me is his priority, it should be my priority. All that being said, um, those visions, I would, I think they changed my, you know, they changed my life. One, because when you hear from God, it, um, tip, it, it gives direction. It gives hope. You know, so God's showing me, okay, there's some wicked plot going on. And he's going to exact judgment because of the nature of some plot. But then he's given not just a, a solution, but a hope of what his kingdom looks like. And he's using images and metaphors and symbols that really resonate with me because I'm a gardener, beekeeper, farmer type. And, um, you know, Jesus, a lot of parables, he used farmers um, and talked, you know, used the idea of a seed as uh, the ultimate symbol of planting so that something can come to life and grow. So, with, as I always say, with that being said, uh, this was before I had any crypto revelations. This is before I, I knew in my heart and believed and had been shown that there's going to be a famine in, in America and it's going to be a, a power outage associated with it. That was an element of that vision. And so this to me kind of gave a little bit of confirmation as to the hope um, that God's going to graft some people into my life at some point so that I'll have a team of people that want to work towards this, that believe what I believe, that are... Um, like-minded and skilled and competent so instead of me worried about I have to learn how to do all these different things I can have a degree of hope and expectation that God will graft the right people at the right time so that his will can come to pass um, and then um, oh gosh I'm drawing a blank oh so when, when I had the, the revelation of, of crypto, I never saw myself as someone who could sow financial seeds, like with a vision of these eternal seeds. I never thought of myself of someone who was going to have wealth to where I could invest in someone else at any significant level. And so once these visions had been deposited in my mind, in my heart, the Lord revealed crypto to me shortly after, and then I started saying, okay, well, finances, if the Lord blesses me with wealth, that's part of the equation of these eternal seeds. And in Texas, land has gone through the roof, so I had this huge burden of how am I going to buy land to grow food? How am I going to buy land to grow food? How am I going to... Because the price of land has skyrocketed. We've had more people from New York, California, Oregon, Washington State. They're moving here in my little town. I live in a town that was 7,000 people at one, you know, 10 years ago. Now we've got people from all over the U.S. living here. If you stop and talk to someone, there's no telling 
how many people from out of state have migrated. Well, with that, the price of real estate has literally gone through the roof. It's tripled in 15 years. So I had this other burden of, you know, land is getting more expensive. How am I going to buy land um, to be obedient to what I feel called to do? And so the crypto revelations and those instructions kind of paired with the vision of the of the seeds and some words that, that Brother Keith gave too about uh, being a financier for the Lord. You know, God gave me the um, revelation of being an investment banker for the Lord. So if I'm going to be able to sow seeds financially, you know, you want to do it in the right places and see the, the biggest yield, um, obviously, you know, it's not your job to sit there and watch it and wait it, but I'm confident that God will make those opportunities known. So, all that being said, I thought that um, this was important to share. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I hope I did it, it justice, but these were received, these visions were received in the summer of 2020, and they were all received, I want to say, within about seven days of, of each other. It was in a, a block, and um, it blessed me. It's given me purpose, something I can cling to, and I do believe there's a lot of wisdom in there for the body of Christ. Anyone who hears it could be encouraged by it, too. So, the other thing is, uh, with with the whole crypto deal, the the wrath, the judgment of, of a greedy plot, right, that God showed me, when we think about the, the wealth transfer, taking the wealth of the wicked and giving it to just people, or God wanting to take it and give it to people in his kingdom for their, you know, for their blessing and for his glory, uh, that kind of tied in with that judgment. And, and the Lord's saying, you know, this cup's almost full. I'm going to take some action. So um, as we look to that, it, it pairs with the wealth transfer, I believe. So I hope this is a blessing and can uh, bless your day. God bless and talk to you all soon.